But yeah, I was going to start it off real easy. Uh, we were talking the other day about doing a segment where we would talk about tattoos, maybe have some veterans send in the ones they've got, and we could just critique them just for fun. And I saw you got the 173rd tattoo recently. Did you end up getting it on your bicep or what? I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there it is. Your forearm. Right Ooh. there on my forearm here. Yeah. Oh, a whole piece. So it's like a whole military sleeve. Yeah, yeah. Well, so you saw like my my Portland, Oregon yeah. one right here, right? Yeah. It's on my bicep before I got out. Yeah, so I, I just added to it. And so okay. it's supposed to be like the soldier's thing yeah, about that's a home. Yeah, man. We'd love, we'd love to do a segment where we just have a bunch of people yeah. send in all their military tattoos or just veterans with tattoos. And just do a whole hour of just going through them. I think that'd be fun. Be exciting. Oh, I, got, I got a cool one if you guys yeah. want to see it real quick. Yeah, um, I'll see it. This is the the Afghan patch. With, oh, nice. I don't I don't remember having that one. That patch. It was the, oh. it was the Afghan Special Forces patch, and they gave me one. I gave them the yeah, tenth, tenth mount. I don't remember oh, okay. seeing the patch at all. No, that's pretty cool. <laughs> well, so man, introduce yourself and and tell us what you do. Uh, my name is Stephen Culp. Uh, I am a homeless outreach specialist uh, for the city of Vancouver on the HART team. HART stands for Homeless Assistance Resource Team. Um, it's a team consisting of five people. Uh, we have a manager, a police officer that's on the team. Um, we have another person who uh, works for Vancouver Ops. Um, uh, doing public works things. And then there's myself and another gentleman. So that's a lot smaller of a group than I, thought, than I thought it was going to so, be. Yeah. I was expecting like a whole huge corporation. I didn't think it would only be five people. And I just want to clarify one thing because the audience is a lot smarter than me, but it's Vancouver in the United yeah. States, not Canada, <laughs> which I got confused earlier this week. <laughs> I was like, oh, he's Canadian. Okay, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> so do you actually go walk in the streets? Uh, or how's that no. work? Do they, they come to you or you go to them? So, yeah, okay. outreach, we, we go to them. Um, so uh, Hart serves as kind of uh, the com or serves the community of unhoused um, people uh, where – but we're also – a good um, contact for the house community um, for Vancouver. And, and it's just the city. So I only work within the city, but um, uh, so people in, that live in Vancouver city, uh, it's a, we're good. Like uh, what's the word I'm yeah. looking for connection to make sure uh, that the community, you know, is, is letting us know, Hey, I, we have, um a rv that's camped here it's been here for a couple of weeks or hey there's this this mess that is in this park or on this street um and so we kind of do all that um and we're, we're what we're trying to do is um respond to all those issues and concerns about homelessness um which also includes uh responding to those uh active campsites and uh making sure the campsites um you know are taking care of themselves um so they have hygiene and sanitation needs um and then uh also connecting people uh living in camps uh to maybe a life-saving or social service resource right and so um Someone may give us a call or an email, and then um, we'll respond to those. And sometimes, um, you know, you get somebody who's like, oh, my gosh, thank you for coming. I, I really I didn't know what to do. Um, and sometimes you just have people like they're like, OK, fine, you know, because uh, there's no uh, camping in parks um, or or like, you know sleeping in your RV on the side of the road and stuff. And so um, there's a whole list of do's and don'ts. We, we also 
as a city um, are uh, responsible and legally uh, responsible for to notify them, hey, so just so you know, the community has let us know like that you are camping here uh, and you're not allowed to. Um, so it's not my job really so much uh, as it is for the police officers that we work with um, to be like, hey, you know, kick rocks. Um, but so I kind of I'm, I get to be that middleman where um, I can be like, hey, uh, you can't be here. Um, and I'm not telling you you have to leave right now, but sooner or later, a police officer probably will show up. In the meantime, you know, can can I get your name? And some people don't. They Like, they straight up don't want um, anything to do with you. Um, but I think nine times out of ten, you're like, hey, you know, you just level with them. And you're like, you know, what, what can I do for you? Um, and a lot of times you'll get nothing. So then you kind of be like, well... Uh, do you want to, you want some water? Like, cause we carry water on us. You you need trash bags to clean up, you know, around you. Cause I find that most of the homelessness that I've worked with, they, they really don't want to be messy. Um, but sometimes things get a little, of out all of the homeless people so, you work with, yeah. how many would you say are veterans for the most part? Roughly. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so it's hard because, um, I would say we get a lot of people that say yeah, they're veterans. Um, and then we, we, yeah. Um, and then, but we have, so there's a computer system called HMIS. It's all through, uh, HUD and, uh, we can look them up and uh, kind of work with them through there. Or we uh, call the VA and we're like, hey, I've got this person. They say they're in the VA. They can look up their name. And if, if somebody's willing to give us their social or birthday, we try to get as much information so that um, we can find out what we're able to do for them. Because um, without right. any information, we're like, we don't know who you are. Um, there's no way to say, you know, there's, there's nothing to go on. Um, but so that's really hard to say. I would say there's definitely less veterans. Um, when I was working at a, a one of our programs called safe park, but I think since I've been doing outreach and touching more people, there's been quite a few veterans, um, whether they served, you know, three months to three years, um, it's kind of it's kind of hit and miss. And usually, you can you can kind of tell. Them. Yeah. So do they talking to these uh, homeless vets? I'm assuming you get a little backstory. I was just wondering if you hear a lot of them saying, you know, not being able to keep in touch was a big part of them becoming homeless or going down that route or if if you think if they were to keep in touch with old veteran buddies and kind of keeping a tight-knit group if they'd be less likely to go down the path they went down um yeah so i think there's a huge huge uh correlation um there's so many different scenarios, though, So since I've been working with the homeless community for since uh, since 2020. Um, so, yeah, so I think we as veterans, we we do need one of each other. Um, I think one of the biggest things with homeless in general is we just need they, people need community, um, like minded folks. We need to find like our people, if you will. Um, so when it comes to veterans, I think, and and personal experience and from talking with you, Jones, um, it was, it's very clear that um, we are very prideful people. And 
so um talking i'm just going to sp- speak for myself and and my experience is we stayed in touch all the time and i didn't share anything that i was going through with you um and it was a pride thing 100 percent. and so i think I would like to let veterans that are watching this know that like, Hey, let go, let go of your pride. Talk to your, you know, your veteran friends. Um, and you know, let them know what's going on emotionally, mentally, maybe even possibly physically. Um, and you know, just let go of the pride and let let people in and level with you. Uh, because, you don't know if they're going through the same thing or not. And um, I wish that uh, I could have been, you know, a better friend to you, Jones, and uh, we could have talked about it. But instead, I was very prideful and I was like, I was like, ah, no, nah, everything's yeah, good. Which, I'm working. Which is doing what the a norm. lot of us tend to do. So uh, um, someone reaches out and asks <laughs> how you're doing. You don't want to. I don't know. A lot of times I'd be like, ah, does he really care? He probably just wants to hear that I'm OK. I'm alive and going. Just say, oh, yeah, everything's fine. Just work, busy, and go on about your business. So I think that's pretty common. People don't want to, like, burden their buddies with what's going yeah. on in their lives because they think the other guy's got the same crap going on. And they may, but they may not. They may actually want to know what's going on in your life. Yeah, so... um I do think there's a small correlation uh, to those who keep in touch and those who don't. Um, I mean, could you imagine uh, having a, a crisis and having to handle it, you know, by yourself um, for those that, you know, may not be able to just to even have someone and be like, Hey, how you doing? You know? Um, so I think, I think the biggest thing that I have seen or talked to homeless veterans with this um they typically have have nobody or feel like they have nobody um so they're alone they they get in a mental health crisis where they start beating themselves up and then it spirals down further and further um until they convince themselves that they're you know dirt um, pretty much are the lowest of lows and they don't deserve anyone or uh, anything. Um, so they go into, um, they, they find what they can control, but it's false control, right? Um, whether it's alcohol or drugs, um, or, or some other addiction, right? There's multiple types for a reason why somebody could be homeless, um, it could be gambling for that matter. Um, and whatever, whatever you think you have a control of, it's false because it's, it literally starts taking over you, um, in some, you know, uh, shape, form, fashion, size, whatever. Uh, and, and then there's, then there's just people that had, like, uh, I've, I had a, a veteran who was just real stubborn. He didn't want anything to do with the VA. Um, uh, he had some bad experiences, but he was also Vietnam. So like, and um, I'm sure you guys know your history, but Vietnam, when those veterans came home, they didn't get the same uh, welcome back as, you know, maybe we did. And so, I do find most of the veterans that I run into. That was a good question because I was going to say what the age group you see. And I was also going to comment that when uh, me and Jones were at Fort Polk together, every deployment that came back at Fort Polk, all the Vietnam veterans would come and greet our units when they came back at Fort Polk. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, sure did. Yeah. And there's a, there's a huge reason. So are there any resources that you're that. that you provide these people that kind of houses them, or or are they just kind of on their own, and you just point them in the right direction? Um, no. So we so I'm not a case manager. So there's a difference between outreach and case management. Um, case management will 
be like, okay, you are now my client and I'm going to uh, work with you and tell, well, they, they uh, work with you pretty much even once you get housed. Um, but I feel so, so yeah. So my job as a, as an outreach is okay. connecting people to those resources, um, whether it is uh, the VA, um, cause like, like I said, some people don't need, didn't, or people did not have a great experience with the VA, so they don't want to go. Um, they don't want to talk to anybody. Um, some of your local, uh, VA hospitals or, or, or VA, um, buildings probably have an outreach that goes out and sees people like I do, but they also do case management. Um, but as far as Vancouver, uh, there's a veteran assistance program um, and center they, that you can walk in and uh, grab a bite if you're homeless. Um, and uh, I think they have some programs where you might be able to earn some money. Um, I actually am supposed to be meeting up with them uh, next week because I haven't learned a whole lot about them. Um, but I, I do know and have been told many times that they have great resources for the veterans to where they will even uh, deal with the actual, like the VA for you so that you don't have like, it's kind of like you, you ever met somebody who's like, I hate the hospital or I hate the dentist. The dentist is a good one. <laughs> Nobody likes a dentist, right? Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, if somebody could go to the dentist for you, that's kind of what, what the, the uh, veterans assistance program is. Um, so they'll, they'll try to get all the information from you so that they can help you get to where you want to be with. So just to clarify, to go to when, the VA, when you reach, go um, out, we, do outreach, right. With, and you run into these veterans, do you then just point them to the VA or does your side have a, any resources that you provide as well? So, um, so we don't really have, we don't have resources as far as, um, direct, we don't have direct resources. Um, but we work with several nonprofit agencies that do have resources, um, such as, uh, like housing vouchers. Um, I do do, uh, housing assessments. So, and that's like the big first step for anybody. Um, and it does have veteran questions in there. So, uh, I'm, I'm like, I'm the middleman pretty much. Um, and then we, like I said, like all, all the nonprofits, um, that we work with, I connect them with certain people. Um, we have a veterans, um, guy who works for another, uh, like the main no, uh, company. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say what company they are, but, uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, so HMIS, which is the computer system that plugs everybody into getting their foot in the door with any, any program, right? Um, I, I can assist with that and then, um, I can let the VA know, or I can let the veterans ho housing assistants know, or I can let, um, any other nonprofit, um, work with them. And we have several, we have several nonprofits that like take case management and have case loads and literally walk them through the process. So do you want to yeah. talk a little bit um, more of the housing assessment? I thought I was kind of curious about I that. Think that's good. <laughs> okay. Um, so the housing assessment, um, it's a, it's a tool. Um, and you ask a various amount of questions um, concerning uh, mental health, um, uh, drug addiction, uh, how long you've been uh, homeless, uh, so that we can find out, like, have you been chronically homeless or not? Um, we also, it also lets us know, like, um, uh, do you have a household? So are you homeless and you have a wife and kid or, um, so it's, it's, 
it literally lets us know like where you are as far as in your l- lack of better words homeless journey um so that we know and can find out the best way to help you um or help the homeless so can you tell us like the distinguishing um oh. it also has a it's also a scoring thing keep going on the scoring thing sorry so so yeah there so there's there's a <laughs> so there's also a score um where it places you in um two two different categories uh one is rapid rehousing and temporary housing um and the way the that kind of works is uh you can it and there's multiple ways it can work um you can either get like uh, assistance for getting your apartment so it'll pay for first last and deposit um and then it'll pay for your rent for uh and it really depends on the person right um and if they have a job um so it can cover somebody's rent and everything uh, in utilities uh i think i think the hurt longest i've heard is up to a year um but it can be shorter um and then the other and then temporary housing kind of works the same way where it's like okay hey we're going to house you um until you can until we can either find a permanent place for you or um or you can get into your own place um and then there's permanent supportive housing which are the more severe cases um whether somebody can really be responsible for even taking care of themselves um and it, they may be you know high mental health or high disability um all that kind of stuff but then some some of the resources that we do is if somebody's like looking to get sober or clean um or just or even just physically healthier um we have resources for that too so uh, and that's aside from the I was curious uh, how many people assessment. a day do you talk to on average cool <laughs> um yeah so, okay so it really depends um I kind of it, my week and my I mean, day is it anywhere from like one to three or more like day. fifty to a hundred? Um, probably fifty to hundred because I'm covering the entire city. And I'm Vancouver. assuming, do you see a lot of repeat um, offenders? So, or I say offenders, but it really, like repeat it really, people where you help house them or point them in the right direction, and then a couple of weeks later you run into the same guy doing the same thing. Um, well, so to kind of mold your question, if you will, um, the hardest part about my job is working with somebody who is really trying to advocate for themselves. Um, and I think, I think that I, I'm not going to say for fact, but I think right now, um, one of the biggest problems in, uh, the U S is maybe yeah. just affordable housing because since I have started working with ha- homelessness in, in 2020, um, I have seen a huge, um, increase in, and I, I think there's probably some facts somewhere. Um, I, I think like we went from a hundred, almost 200 and now we're almost like 600. Um, and, and, and I think that's, it was a re, uh, resource or study that I saw in, from 2019 to 2021. So I'm sure it's even more now. Um, but uh, so homelessness is growing, and we're and but housing, affordable housing, is not growing as fast. Um, so I see, and I I I make uh, a good rapport. Um, with a lot of the homeless that I'm working with multiple times a, a week or at least, you know, uh, twice a week. It, it really depends because sometimes we have 
so we get emails from the community um letting us know like hey uh there's this there's this new tent that's camping on the sidewalk it's blocking the sidewalk and you know if it's a a place where like people like walking their neighborhood it, that's not a great place for somebody to pitch their tent so um so we'll go out and meet those people and try to be like hey you know is there anything we can help you with um and and again it's it's like it's and to let them know what they can or where they can and cannot be and what they can and cannot do so i just did um, a quick search but uh yeah so oh sorry it also depends i was just saying i just did a quick search to answer your question it's gone up by 2000 in the last year i was going to add just a little bit too i went on the i went on the va's website okay, see i was way off they just say a quick little blurb the number of veterans experiencing homeless fell by 11% in early 2020 but it's been more than 55% since 2010 oh. And they're trying to hold, they're trying to help at least thirty eight thousand unsheltered yeah. ve veterans right now. That's their goal for twenty twenty three. Okay. And yeah, it's yeah. Like I said, it's, you know, what type of resources do you do for, uh, say, a family of homeless? The process. The is process. What I'm okay. Okay. Um, so many, many homeless have, uh, pets because of that community, that companionship that I talked about earlier. Um, so there are places that accept pets, um, that are like temporary housing, um, and permanent housing. Uh, and then families, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's really unique because, there's a lot of there's actually a lot of programs out there, even through um, the kids that are in school. There's programs for those kids and and the kids families. Um, but the process is kind of is very similar as far as the housing um, assessment goes. Um, just there's there's more than one and the vulnerability is higher because you have a kid. Right. Um, so there's not a huge, huge difference. Um, I do find that, that it may be a little harder um, for um, being eligible for multiple um, programs because some some of the programs allow certain people and most programs are for single and couples. Um, a lot of people don't like seeing, you know, kids homeless. Um, so I, I think that is probably the hardest. The most, I've never ran into kids outside, outside. Um, I have ran into families uh, with kids um, at the Safe Park program where they were in an RV or a car that probably... um, or a camper. But I haven't, I haven't ran into anybody like, Hey, my that family probably has a lot to tent. do with having the kids. Once you have them, you kind of get your crap together and start like panic mode, rushing to get things. Cause not only do you have companionship now, you have responsibility. I mean, no matter how you feel about it yourself, you're going to try and get that kid in a house. I'm curious about the pets though. I mean, I'm sure you see dogs and cats, but are we seeing any yeah. crazy yeah. animals? Any rabbits? Yeah, rabbits, possums. Um, I hit. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, actually, I was I was going to say rabbits. I was hoping he was going to say um, possums. The, uh, in in Vancouver, for some Jones reason, Jones and I specialize in rabbits. <laughs> Vancouver, so. <laughs> well, so I don't know why, but you can just be walking around anywhere in the city of Vancouver and you will, you will see little rabbits all over the place. I don't know why. I think maybe somebody let loose a couple of rabbits and now they're I just think I know who did taking it. over the city I of think Vancouver. I, know who did I don't it. know. Um, but uh, we've had a, <laughs> it was you guys. Um, so, 
uh, but we have, I've had, I've had uh, a few people uh, that I've worked with that have had rabbits and uh, it, one of them was at safe park when I was over at safe park and uh, <laughs> he, he would, he had like a harness for this rabbit and everything. And I mean, it was a good size rabbit, um, but uh, he would let it out <laughs> just, just like a dog. And uh, there was this, kind of stretch of grass and with some trees and it was so funny because he would let this rabbit like pull him along and he where he was like doing this like ah like running after the rabbit but he wasn't really like gonna fall over but it was just it was goofy and cute with the relationship he had with his rabbit it was great. rabbits are a trending pet so i'm not surprised <clears throat> that's kind of cool he had his own little harness though that's that's <laughs> hilarious do you have like any uh like any really cool stories in your experience yeah. like one of those was, like stories that you're just like wow i i got to help like, someone today and 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 this is this is came into fruition or, or something along those lines um yeah i, I i've got a few um so I've got two veterans off the top of my head that I've helped. And then uh, one gentleman who I, I just never thought it was going to happen. Um, so when I was working at the Safe Park program, uh, the Safe Park the is is a program where if you are living in a camper RV or car um, and we have a they have a spot, you could you can register. There's a code of conduct and all that um and uh so it's not outreach they would come to me and then i was i was facilitating the program as a staff member and uh so two two gentlemen um in particular that were veterans i'll start with that one or those two um uh so the first one he came in um he was brought in by one of the heart team members um or referred by one of the heart team members came in really i guess he didn't he he really didn't want to be there at first he was like i'm not about this didn't didn't think anybody was going to help um and then him and i were talking one day and he because a lot of I've noticed that a lot of the veterans that I've talked to, they think they can't do anything because they don't have their DD two fourteen, they don't have any paperwork, right? Um, and so, <laughs> so they they're like, oh, I don't have anything. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, I don't have anything. So. <laughs> You got to keep that in there. Um, so they don't, they feel like they don't have anything for them to be eligible for all the veteran benefits. Um, and that was kind of where this guy was at. He was like, oh, I don't have this and I don't have that. So I, I connected him to one of the outreach um, programs. He got a case manager and uh and he actually was working with the case manager at the VA and so um there was a few times where i did have to advocate for him i think he ended up getting a new case manager um because the other one was overloaded or whatever but um long story short uh he ended up getting his he ended up getting paper ready um he found out what he was eligible for uh, he started looking for apartments, and then they put him in a temporary housing for veterans that we have here um, in Vancouver. And uh, as far as I know, he's still there, and he's working on a part-time job. Um, it just, it's pretty crazy because this guy was somebody who was like, nobody can help me. Very, very kind of on the, the defensive. Um, and so to as soon as like him and I spoke and I started advocating for him when he realized that he 
wasn't in it alone. He he started advocating for himself um, and realizing, oh, like I can do this and I can do that. And this is what's available to me. And then that's awesome. I was doing man. awesome. Um, and I think part of that was fixing his truck. And that's how Safe Park program was able to help him is uh, other than I was advocating for him, but he was able to fix his truck there as long as there was no liquids. I think, so, I think yeah. that falls back just, a little bit. Oh. Um, another gentleman, uh, he actually came in. Oh, no, I was just going to oh, add sorry, in. Uh, sorry. I think that falls back to what you said earlier. So as veterans, we have that pride. And it sounds like a little bit maybe he broke down a little bit of his pride and, and then found out you know, that he did. And then you were able to get him in the right direction. So that's awesome. Yeah, and I think it, I think it helped that um, the heart team member that got him to come in was a veteran, and then as soon as I let him know like, I was also a veteran, he was like, he was like, all right, what's up? Like, what can you do for me? <laughs> no, that's what it's all about, man. He's got to help out our buddies. Um, the next gentleman. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, so the other one was, he was pretty simple. Um, He came in, he uh, had like this cool trailer um, that was like from like a motorcycle trailer, covered one. And uh, he set it up so that he could live in it. It was pretty cool. But we showed up, or he showed up to Safe Park, and... uh, him and I started talking and I, as soon as I started talking to him about like some of the things that were available to him, um, he was like, well, I have all this paperwork. And I was like, okay, great. Let's get you a case manager. And he was there for maybe five months, which is pretty short. And and now him and the other gentleman, I think, I think they live right across from each other. Um, which is pretty cool. But so it's just it really depends on in how defensive somebody is, um, because yeah, this guy was like, was like, yeah, nobody will help me and this and that, and I was like, well, let me help you then, and he was like, okay, what can you do? And I was like, well, what do you have? And that was it. I mean, he was like, oh, here's here's all my paperwork. I was like, all right, great, I'm gonna get you a case manager, your paper ready, we'll send it, and he was on his way. I have a question too. Uh, if if oh, now I will admit. Go ahead, man. No, sorry. I'm I'm noticing yeah, you guys a little are little hearing me late. <laughs> We're like on the you know the television yeah, station where they're it. always like they ask the reporter and then he waits like five seconds and then he answers. <laughs> oh, I was well, I was so going to go in a different say? direction. So okay. Um, so I will admit, like n- neither one of them were users. Uh, so. It, it does make that easier. So the, the, this third guy I'm going to talk about, um, he he was heavily drinking um, all the time, uh, um, and he would he would go to the store and he'd come back like acting like he's on his phone, and you'd be you'd be like, "Hey, so and so," and he'd turn and be like, "Oh, hey," and like completely you you knew nobody was on the line because. He he would just put his phone away. He didn't say bye to anybody or or nothing. Um, but uh, he he was he was hard to because he continued to um, tell you what you wanted to hear. Um, in in my industry, we kind of call it, we kind of call it lip service, um, where people are like, "Oh yeah, I'm doing X Y Z," but they're not. Um, or, or you're like, hey, you can't do something, and they're like, oh yeah, I'm not doing that. I because <laughs> I do this. Um, so it's it's lip service. They tell you what you what you want to hear, um, which makes it difficult because you want to trust them and you want to believe right. them so that you can help them. Um, but uh, so, sometimes they'll they lie about the weirdest things. Um, so this gentleman, I was trying to help him out um, with drinking, and he knew. He needed help. Uh, and 
he so he he was pissing outside of his car and i i caught him in his lies because i don't uh, you guys ever heard of urine be <laughs> no. gone <laughs> okay so urine be gone is uh if you spray it on um urine it will bubble but if you spray it on like a clean surface nothing happens it even if it's like you know uh you got fish guts on your ki- kitchen counter if you spray it nothing it doesn't bubble so so i had some urine being on and i was like i was like hey do you know what this does and i explained to him what it does so i sprayed it in and where i knew he wasn't peeing and sprayed it where i knew he was and it bubbled and so I was like, I was like, stop, you know, just stop lying to me. Um, it took some h- hard, heavy love um, to f- get him to accept detox. Um, and then once he got detox to actually go into uh, like a like a alcohol anonymous like facility. Um, and we have. I, I really truly think we have some of the best outreach workers because um, there was a gal from one of the nonprofits that we work with. She came in and checked all the boxes, dotted all the T's, or crossed. All, you know what I'm saying. So she she had all their ducks in a row, and this gentleman had been working for with her for I think two weeks, and she got all these ducks in a row to where like he would come up with an excuse for one thing or another. And she was like, Nope, we we're doing this. Yep. I've got this covered. You can do this because of that. And it was, it was phenomenal. So he had no excuses because she had literally covered everything and got him into, uh, the detox and got him into the alcohol anonymous facility. And I ran into him at Winco, and this is a couple months back, but I ran in, into him at Winco, and uh, he was like, hey, Steven. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know this dude. <laughs> like, I, don't, I didn't recognize him at all. Um, he had shaved his face. He had a big old beard and kind of scraggly hair. And uh, I, didn't, I, I legitimately didn't recognize him. And to where... I was like, uh, do I know you? And he was like, you really don't remember me? And I was like, I was like, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, I felt bad. And he was like, he was like, it, it's me from safe park. He was like, thank you so much. And I was like, Oh my God. I was, it, it was like, it was just like, you know, come to light type of thing where I was like, Holy cow. I don't, I had no idea it was you. And I would have never guessed in a million years. It was him. Um, but he told me how he w- went through his process in AA and he's actually still at the facility, but now he's like helping other people. Um, so those, those stories are the ones that I'm like, that, like, that's just awesome. Um, to b- be at a point where y- you feel the need to lie about peeing outside <laughs> and now you're yeah, that is, helping that's great. others in recovery as well. So. That's great. You know, I was just thinking, what do you think is the best advice you could give to um, a veteran or maybe, you know, someone who's on the cusp of being homeless? Uh, what, what would you tell them? Um, I would tell them that you're, you're, you're definitely not alone. Uh, let go of the pride find your community there. And there's a bunch of resource uh, resources for just finding community out there. Um, there's the fallen outdoors, which is one of the programs that I found, uh, when I was, uh, feeling pretty low. Um, it's, uh, I, I think they're on the East coast as well as the West coast. I think they're nationwide, um, fallen outdoors. They provide hunting, fishing trips. So like hunting, big game birds, uh, everything like that. And then fishing trips for everything as well. Um, 
and it's it's completely free to you. They bring their supplies. If you need a weapon, they'll bring the weapon. Um, but it's all it's all veterans um, that are you know you go on a hunting trip with other veterans that could be struggling with some of the same things. Um, so that was one of the programs that I really kind of leaned into. Um, then there's uh, Mission Twenty Two um, that brings uh, veteran suicidal awareness. Um, and they do a lot of stuff there. Um, there's a few other programs that I've looked on, uh, that I follow on Instagram even. Um, but find your community. Uh, I know there's even sports. Uh, I know here in, uh, the Northwest, there's a veterans slow pitch softball team. Um, and that's, they have a co-ed men's and a women's, um, team. Um, so you're not alone. Find something that you um, you can connect with people, connect with other veterans, even if it's uh, just going to like a, a session where you sit and talk with people. Um, I know that for me, a counselor didn't really work. I felt it was awkward. Um, I didn't know this person. We're like I feel like I felt like we were forced to talk to each other because we were in this room and I asked to talk to somebody. Um, so it didn't really work for me. But softball and uh, uh, falling outdoors, that, that's what really helped me to touch. Um, I was going to say to touch on the uh, 22. For those There's... of you who don't know, that's how many veterans commit suicide every day. So that's a very important number on this channel. Well, one a day is way too many, but 22 is. It's getting ridiculous, man. So, like he said, hunting, fishing, softball leagues, jujitsu, the gym. Yep. Find just a group of people doing something that you're doing. Because that's a, that's a huge number. And I think to your point, too, what you're just saying is, you know, it is subjective. Sometimes counseling works for some people and sometimes it's other, other ways. But to your point, when you get back into that veteran community, you do have a sense of trust, at least with me. When I, I feel like I can talk to another veteran differently than I can someone else. And I feel like I, I can open up a little bit more. So that's hopefully along the lines of what you were saying. When you have one of those veteran communities like the softball league, you can get around like-minded people and hopefully maybe open up and, and maybe discuss some of your problems. And then you have, everyone's got different resources or different ideas and they can all help you. That's kind of one of the goals we we're trying to accomplish on this channel is help provide people with resources and, and cool ideas and, and just help connect the veteran community. And, and to Joan's point, 22 is way too many. And hopefully this, this and other programs can help lower that number. We want to get it down as low as we can go. Yeah. I, uh, it's one of the reasons why I really uh, appreciate you guys asking me to be on the show is uh, if, if I can help in any way, shape, or form um, from helping veterans get back on their feet um, or uh, feeling like they're not alone, then I'm all for it. And Jones, I totally forgot <laughs> about working out, and that was one of my niches too. So Yeah, that's a, that's a big one, man. It helps with all kinds of mental and physical and everything helps you get around a bunch of people who are all trying to better themselves physically. And that'll help you mentally help your self image too. Kind of hard to think bad about yourself if you're steadily, you know, seeing improvements. hundred percent. Steven, did you have a, a little bit of a, a disconnect from working out when you got out and then you're like, Oh, I need to get back into this kind of thing. Um, no, uh, mainly because I had a, I had a buddy who, uh, I met through softball who was in impeccable shape. Um, and I actually just by chance got asked to play softball. Um, the season was just starting and one of my sister's friends was putting on a co-ed team and, uh, we grew up playing, my sister grew up playing softball. And, uh, so this gal, I knew who she was. And so she asked my sister if she wanted to play, not knowing I was home. And, 
my sister was like, well, hey, do you want Steven to join? And uh, the guy was like, oh, Steven's back? Yeah, we need, we'll need. we put him in center field. And that's been my position pretty much my whole life. And I've played ball since I was like four. Um, and so uh, between softball and then one of the guys that was on the team, uh, he was in really, really good shape. And uh, I was kind of like, hey, where do you work out? And then we found out that we worked out at the same place, just at different times. And then, so we started working out together and, uh, yeah, I got, I pretty much haven't stopped really working out. Nice. Since. Yeah. That's nice. good stuff. So I guess just to wrap things up a little bit, um, we're going to provide hopefully some, some of these links that Steven, uh, told us about and anybody who's maybe experiencing, that kind of uh, trouble in their life, or maybe know someone who has reached someone out and provide some of these links and resources, and hopefully we can help each other out. Yeah, I agree with that. And I hope uh, everybody has a great weekend. We really appreciate you coming on Culp and getting to talk to you is always great. It's been a long time since I've gotten to see you. So I know we reach out on Facebook and Instagram, stuff like that. But it's been a long time since we've actually talked. Probably 12 years, 13 years. Oh, I hate so to admit that. It was but really yeah. good having you on. Yeah, it was really good yeah. to meet you, man. Yeah, let's <laughs> yeah, not uh, have that kind of stretch again. <laughs> nice meeting you too, Gilly. Yeah, let's right. pop smoke, man. Y'all have a good weekend. Heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs>